Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Doug Berkey, Executive Director of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to our Schriever Space Power Forum Series. Now, we're pleased to have Lieutenant General Bill LaCorey with us today. He's the Deputy Chief of Space Operations for Strategy, Plans, Programs, Requirements, and Analysis at Headquarters United States Space Force. So translation into English, that means General LaCorey is overall responsibility for the strategies, requirements, and budget of the United States Space Force. His career has included numerous operations and staff positions in, in the Air Force Space Command, National Reconnaissance Office, the Air Force Secretariat, U.S. European Command, the Office of Secretary of Defense, and the White House, and the United States Space Force. He's also a graduate, former instructor at Weapons School. So with that, sir, thanks so much for your time today. I'd like to pass the mic to you to provide some opening remarks. Awesome. Well, Doug, thank you to you and the Air and Space Forces Association, the Mitchell Institute, for the opportunity to come talk to you and, and the audience. And thanks for those that are joining today. Um, I thought from an opening uh, uh, comments perspective, it might be useful, given where we are in the year, to talk a little bit about the budget work that, uh, that my team has been working on. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, fiscal year 23, uh, and then pivot over to fiscal year 24 to kind of give a little bit of a look ahead. So, um, you know, the team just finished up all the work that went into building the fiscal year 23 budget. Um, that uh, budget was highlighted by an initiation of a, a pivot to more resilient architectures, specifically for us in the missile warning, missile tracking mission area uh, for last year's budget. Uh, and we got a, a large a chunk of money to be able to move and begin to uh, move our architecture into more resilient uh, place there. Um, resilient architectures are obviously a key piece uh, of our contribution to the way the Department of Defense will implement the national defense strategy. Uh, specifically, resilient architectures will help us in the integrated deterrence uh, way that the Department of Defense uh, will implement that NDS. Um, they're also a key piece of Secretary Kendall's operational imperatives, which I know most of your audience is, is well aware of. Uh, Secretary Kendall had seven imperatives that he's given to both services, to the Department of the Air Force. Uh, and those imperatives are to allow us to modernize uh, and be able to stay ahead of our pacing right. challenge, China. Uh, and so a, a bunch of our uh, budget last year was an early start towards that. His intent with these imperatives was that they had informed the 24 budget. So if we think about, um, for anybody that's ever done uh, defense budgeting, you know full well that no sooner do you turn in one year's budget and you immediately pivot to the next year's, right? So um, the team that, that did so much great work on the 23 budget, as that got delivered as part of the president's budget uh, several months ago, immediately begins to focus on the fiscal year 24 budget. And our intent there will be to pick up right where we left off in 23. We'll uh, want to move forward and complete our uh, pivot and missile warning missile tracking, uh, but then begin to move into other mission areas as well. Um, all of our uh, budget um, inputs, if you will, and the secretary's imperatives are informed by uh, work that one of my counterparts Parts, Mr. Andrew Cox and his team uh, perform at the Space War Fighting Analysis Center. So their analysis informed the missile warning missile tracking pivot last year. Uh, they're working on uh, additional analysis this year. We can talk about that a little bit later, but uh, basically space data transport and ground moving target indicator are two areas that we anticipate will be a big piece of our 24 budget as we go forward. Those dovetail in with Secretary Kendall's operational imperatives as well. Uh, and so, um, you know, the, you're never at a lull when it comes to defense budgeting. As you're, as you're wrapping one uh, budget up, then you'll move into the next one when it comes to building our service POM. Uh, we do that in, in close concert with uh, General uh, Dave Nahum and General Rick Moore uh, and the teams on the Air Force side uh, as they build their budget uh, and ultimately bring them to Secretary Kendall for, uh, for his approval as, uh, as the input into the DOD uh, programming and budget review process. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the other, as you read off that rather long duty title, um, what that really means, uh, <laughs> yep. Uh, what it really means is uh, I've got a, a great team that is focused on a lot of different things uh, and setting a foundation for the Space Force. The other half of my team is on the, the five side of the house, so right. the strategy and requirement side. And so lots of good work uh, going on to support the uh, Department of Defense as right. we develop the new national defense strategy. We can talk to that. Um, work on requirements is absolutely critical. Uh, concepts that feed those requirements. And also in the five uh, lanes, we have our international partnering team, which works really closely with uh, Kelly Seabolt and her team 
14 uh, international affairs experts on the secretariat side, as well as our three field commands have an international affairs presence as well. So lots of good work going on, a great team doing it uh, with me. Uh, and so lo really look forward to the conversation today. Well, we were talking about it earlier. It's an incredible portfolio that you have. I'm not sure when you sleep, but the work you guys are, are executing is incredible. And to watch the results in, in this new pivot that, you know, the stand-up new service and the operational environment that we face right now, it's just incredible what you guys are doing. So thank you thank for you. that. So I want to kick it over to some, some questions initially, and I'm going to start with some that, that I've written out, and then we'll, we'll turn to the Great. audience. But for the first one, you know, we're hearing a lot with Hill testimony. And, and folks are highlighting the role of the Space Force as, as a joint integrator for all DOD space requirements. So could you explain to us what that means in a pragmatic fashion? Sure. I mean, what's been accomplished so far in this lane when it comes to, you know, the larger DOD space enterprise? Sure. So a uh, little over a year ago, the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, chaired by the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, designated the Space Force as the integrator for all joint space mm -hmm. requirements. Uh, so the work that we've done thus far uh, in this uh, relatively short amount of time uh, is to work with the joint staff on uh, understanding clear intent and shaping what that role will be. Right. Um, and so we've had uh, numerous exchanges with uh, Admiral Grady's team on the, on the joint, or General Milley's team and, mm -hmm. and Admiral Grady's team that runs the JROC um, uh, as a part of uh, intent there. And, and really, we think about it, we've established a new service uh, and a service that's responsible for the space domain and recognizing that there are numerous requirements throughout the Department of Defense that have space connections or are all about space. Uh, they wanted to have an entity or one organization that would uh, look to integrate those. Uh, and so that's what the Space Force will do. We've, what we've started thus far, our first step uh, is in the uh, Intelligence Surveillance and Requirements mission area. Uh, and we've got a team that has started uh, working with uh, all the other services, mm -hmm. the combatant commands, uh, as well as the joint staff and the intelligence community on really getting a handle around what are the Department of Defense's requirements for space-based intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. And so that team has been going um, since the start of the new year. Uh, General Thompson, our vice chief, reached out to his counterparts on the JROC and said, hey, we're, this is the first mission area we're going to tackle. Right. We we'll use this as an exemplar. Uh, they all immediately responded back, said, yeah, absolutely. We're in. We'd love to do this. And so their teams have been a part of uh, it's uh, my team and then General Leah Le Le Lauterbach's team on our S2 side, so our intelligence folks, given the mission area that we're looking at, right. uh, the partnering together with those other services and the intel community to really take a look at what is the landscape of all of the requirements documents that are out there yeah understand from the other services what other requirements they have to, to compile those together. What we've got drafted right now uh, is an intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance needs memo mm -hmm. uh, that we're working through the joint staff coordination mechanism. So that was one of the things that in the conversations with the joint staff about this role, uh, we decided rather than creating additional processes and, and bureaucracy, we would leverage the existing processes, sure. but we would be a uh, a, we would fill a new role in those yep. processes as the integrator. And so that needs memo that we took to our vice chief to get his uh, blessing and approval then went into joint staff coordination at this point through the functional capability boards. Eventually it will go to the joint capability right. board and then to the JROC. Right. The intent would be for that memo to get validated by the joint requirements oversight council. So by the vice chairman and the service vices. Uh, and that's what we would uh, have as a starting point for integrating all of the joint requirements yeah. for space-based ISR. And we can't do that in a vacuum. And so we've, we've also got the intelligence community working that with us. No, huge report. Just audience is going to want to know timeline. Sure. Yeah. So we're hoping that later this, so we've started the coordination on the memo at the functional capability board mm -hmm. uh, process. Since this is the first one right. of a kind, we're kind of giving it a little bit of time to, to work through there. But ideally, uh, in the coming months, we'll have it to the point where we can take it to the JROC and, and look for a validation of that okay. one. And then we'll move on to another mission area. No, good deal. So I want to push that thread a little further. So, you know, how does this function work given all the Army has been doing lately to expand its space capabilities? And, and to be specific, I'm talking about the service building its own proliferated LEO constellation, you know, keeping its space control assets, SATCOM capabilities, and more. I mean, do you think this organic approach is helpful given that one of the reasons for standing up the Space Force was to bring the multiple 
you know, elements of the DOD space enterprise in, into one service? Sure. So a great question. Uh, the short answer is I, I think there's room for both. Um, and and uh, we've had great conversations with the other services about space capabilities specifically. Um, later this year, uh, you mentioned satellite communications. So later this year, uh, we anticipate that the Army Wideband Satellite Communications uh, infrastructure will transfer over to the United States Space Force, as will the Navy's Narrowband mm -hmm. Satellite Communications. For the first time ever, then, that will give one service the responsibility for all military satellite communications. Uh, and it's been really good discussions with both of those services um, at the staff levels, as well as with the chiefs, um, and, and to make sure that we're going to do that in a smart fashion, in a smooth fashion, and ultimately have no impact on the end users, sure. uh, if you will. Um, we've also recently had a set of staff talks with uh, the Navy, okay. uh, where we focused on um, not only requirements, which I was alluding to earlier, but also um, concepts of operations, uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures, those types of things to share our thoughts uh, as individual services so that we really truly understand where are the touch points between the two services. Our, we would anticipate doing that with the other services as well. That sure. first one with the Navy was a, was a really good conversation. Uh, and like I said, we're, we're looking to do that with the other services as well. Nah, it's good to hear because that, that integration I think, is so important to get the efficiencies and really break down some of the stovepipes that we want. So, you know, in events like this, one of the most common questions we get you know, towards senior leaders from the audience, it all relates to the, the work of the SWAC and future force designs <clears throat> and the Space Force. So can you give us a little bit more of a sense of where things are with missile warning, missile tracking, force design? And, and I also think folks want to hear a little bit more about how the Space Force is, is looking <clears throat> to transform the service into a true warfighting force, not just a sport entity. Sure, yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. And I, I would say uh, sitting where we are today after uh, having gone through a little bit more than a year's worth of force design work with uh, Mr. Cox and General Povac mm -hmm. and their team, um, and, and then that feeding our requirements and budget side of things for, for my team. Uh, I think if, uh, if Andrew was here next to me, both of us would say we were a little bit nervous in the beginning of we're going to do something new for the first time. Um, it's a unique skill set uh, that does that type of force design analysis. Right. It's, a, it's a unique set of systems that they have that allow them to do that. Um, but it takes time to do that. Um, and uh, the Department of Defense budget process uh, runs on a certain timeline. And so we've got to be able to produce force designs in time to feed budgets. And so um, we knew going in what the timelines were, but you just don't know how that first one's going to go. I think we would both say, I think General Raymond would say, we're very pleased with how mm -hmm. things ended up. The uh, That force design work that they did helped to uh, unify other elements of the Department of Defense and the national space community uh, around missile warning, missile tracking. So it wasn't just Space Force teams uh, that were in, involved in that force design. Right. We had Space Development Agency and the Missile Defense Agency also involved in that particular force design. Uh, where we ended up then allowed us to figure out who's got the unique roles for different sure. elements of this force design. Um, and so that really did help us uh, when it came to building our budget inputs. But more importantly, uh, what's key to uh, successful budgeting within the Department of Defense is having the analysis and the data to back sure. up uh, what you're putting in for that request and, and the design and the analysis that they had. Um, uh, Andrew and team, uh, countless briefings to all kinds of entities within the Department of Defense, outside the Department of Defense, on the Hill, um, it's it's really proven uh, its worth, and and we were we had some good success in the in the twenty three budget, um, which ultimately will translate to the right type of capability on orbit for our sure. warfighters. Um, we're, we, they are just like my team had to immediately pivot. So did the, uh, the SWAC team uh, and they're working on their next force designs. I mentioned earlier, they're working on a space data transport force design uh, as well as a ground moving target indicator force design and uh, analysis of alternatives that goes with that. Those are probably the next two big ones. So we'll start to move into satellite communications uh, clearly and then a little bit of ISR. Uh, that ISR needs memo that I was talking mm -hmm. about earlier uh, is a piece of a connection to this uh, GMTI uh, force design. I don't want to get ahead of those force right. designs. They're uh, in the process of completing. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight that not only is it feeding our budget inputs, but as we talked about Secretary Kendall's operational imperatives, his number one imperative was to develop a resilient space order of battle. He right. recognizes uh, what that means for the warfighter. Uh, and so as we do space data transport, as we do missile warning and missile tracking and other mission areas, we want to do them in a resilient fashion. So resilience is a 
key piece of what Andrew and team are analyzing, as well as performance and cost. Um, but that those force designs are a part of the analysis that's going into Secretary Kendall's operational imperatives. Uh, and he, of anyone, is very uh, much um, reliant and insistent, rightly so, upon data yep. uh, to make good decisions. Uh, he knows these seven imperatives are critical if we're going to um, be able to stay ahead of our pacing challenge. Uh, and so he's looking for analysis in all of those imperatives. Andrew's team is feeding several of those. Now, and when you talk about that work, I mean, the level of sophistication of what they're doing, the complexity, yet to make it understandable to the external stakeholders, especially you know, thinking the Hill, that is so impressive because that is a very, very difficult skill set. I mean, it's what we strive to do here at Mitchell. So we have a ton of respect for everything your team and, and that they're doing as well. Well, so, thank you. That's uh, amazing. Okay. So General Raymond recently mentioned the idea of Space Force becoming a tactical level ISR provider, independent of what the NRO contributes at the national level. So what are your thoughts on, on this concept in terms of Space Force ISR? I mean, you know, when do you see it becoming a reality? Sure. Um, so I, as General Raymond talks about this each and every time, um, he highlights that we need to do this uh, in concert with the intelligence community. Our, our relationships that we have well, now as an 18th member of the intelligence community, um, it, uh, you know, we're part and parcel and, and a part of that entity. Uh, this is not uh, designed to replace the National Reconnaissance Office or the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency or any of the other uh, elements of the IC. But we do believe that General Raymond does, as well as Secretary Kendall, um, that there will be a piece of intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance that maybe we've done in the air domain previously right. that only makes sense to move uh, to the space domain. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to have to do that in a resilient fashion as well. Part of the reason for moving it um, is the unique aspect that being on orbit provides you with a larger air coverage area. Um, certainly our adversaries have uh, anti-access area denial right. capabilities that will prevent aircraft from getting into certain areas. Uh, that's not to say that our domain isn't equally contested, yeah. which is why as we do these force designs that we've got to do it in a resilient fashion. Um, but uh, I mentioned that ISR needs memo as an example, as that uh, gets staffed again, working with uh, the intelligence community, specifically on the team, we've had national reconnaissance office and director national intelligence mm -hmm. members uh, part invited and participate. Um, what we anticipate is we'll have an ISR needs memo that says here are all of the DOD's space-based ISR requirements. Mm -hmm. There is a large portion of those that the national intelligence community will be able to already meet and will be able to continue to meet. Right. We don't want to replace that, but we do believe that when you look at that, what the, the next step after that needs memo is a, gaps anal a gap analysis. And we do believe that while the national community will be able to fill a large portion of that, there will be a subset that's left over. Uh, and that would be Title 10 uh, type capabilities right. that it makes sense for us to, to go do. And that's what General Raymond talks about when he's talking about tactical intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Now, and that makes a lot of sense because you, when you think about the timelines in play for more of the national assets, that is fundamentally different at times than a tactical application in a specific point of geography where seconds and minutes are, are the state of play. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I've been a part of the uh, intelligence community, part of the National Reconnaissance right. Office for several assignments. Um, uh, wonderful uh, missions, people, and memories for, for me. And I learned a bunch and it, it made me um, I have, have a much broader perspective, I think, that um, uh, that time. Um, and and you know, General Raymond also always says, as does Dr. Scalise, our relationship uh, between the two organizations has never been better. Right. Uh, and working things uh, together collaboratively uh, to find complementary ways of doing business uh, is part and parcel of that. No, it's really good to hear. So when it comes to ISR capabilities, and we've seen a lot of growth in the commercial sector. So you know, how do you see this impacting the Space Force? And will the service build its own assets for tactical ISR? Are we going to you know, just leverage commercial options or is it going to be some combination of the two? Yeah, sure. So uh, another great question. I mean, I, I think the short answer is for just about everything that we're seeing these days, you know, hybrid approaches mm -hmm. um, certainly give us more flexibility. Actually, some you get some resilience from that as well. That's certainly a piece of the resilience analysis that Andrew and team have done. And so I would anticipate it will be a combination uh, of things, uh, both uh, government owned and operated commercial. There is a, a plethora. There are uh, a large amount of commercial companies that are uh, getting into this right. space or already in this space. And it would be uh, you know, short-sighted of us not to leverage uh, uh, what's out there. And so I would anticipate that the 
combination of, of commercial and government of Title 10 and Title 50 will be what the nation needs and, and what the nation will have going forward. Ultimately, that force design that Andrew and team are working, um, which they're doing uh, in concert. So the National Reconnaissance Office is a part of that uh, uh, GMTI force design as well. Um, doing that in concert with them. Uh, when we did the, to go back to the commercial side of this, when we did the missile warning, missile tracking uh, force design, one of the things that Andrew and team did for that force design and intend to do for all the others is to have a business fair huh. um, where we not only talk about what it is that we're yeah. doing, uh, but this one was kind of unique when it comes to to business fairs in that um, the SWAC team not only gave a briefing about here's the threat we were looking at, here's the current systems, and here's where we believe we need to pivot. Here's what our analysis says. But they did it in a digital environment as well, where they said, here's what our threat models look like in this model-based system engineering environment. And here's what our blue models look like. They fly them against each other, if you will, uh, using a whole host of supercomputers and, and the digital environments with the intent to make sure that whatever solutions that we're exploring you know, hold up to the, the, the test of Kepler and physics. Yeah. Um, and so that's really the only way to do force design. And so they showcased that at this business fair. And then as the individual companies left, they gave them the digital instantiation wow. of the red models and the blue models and said, take this back to your own companies um, and play with it in your digital wow. space. And if you come up with a better way of, of doing this, we'd like to see it. And we'd like to see it in the digital world and have that conversation. Uh, and so the intent would be to do that for each of the missionaries going forward to truly uh, be able to understand what it is that commercial is bringing. Uh, and you know, they're constantly evolving, pushing technology further and further. Uh, and we wouldn't be where we are today without that. And we're going to need that going forward. Right. As well. No, it's really impressive to hear. And and that kind of collaboration and, and open partnership, I think, is crucial. I mean, so often we hear stories where classification levels are so high and all it's just nearly impossible. So to encourage that sort of, of dialogue, I think it's just fantastic. So on a related note, Secretary Kendall and General Raymond have highlighted moving the GMTI mission from EHJ stars to space. So what sort of timelines are we looking at to manifest this at an operational level? And, you know, is this going to involve some mission gaps here or is this something where you think it's going to be a direct handoff? Sure. So another great question, um, certainly in the forefront of not only our secretary and our chief, but both of our services yeah. as we go forward. Absolutely. The goal is to not have a gap. Uh, we stay closely connected to understand, uh, you know, where their budgets where uh, um, the Air Force budget will uh, work from a divestiture perspective right. on capabilities like that. And then how fast can we get to a space capability or what other options are out there? Um, but uh, specific to this uh, area, that GMTI force design is due to complete uh, later this month. Mm -hmm. uh, it will then feed into Secretary Kendall's operational imperative on moving target indicator, right. which will ultimately um, inform our Space Force budget and the budget that the secretary uh, provides to the Department of Defense. Sure. Then we'll go through the program budget review process, mm -hmm. right? And so that'll be, you know, probably into the October, November timeframe. Then that will, uh, then we'll engage with the Office of Management and Budget um, uh, because they're a key piece of, of ultimately deciding what the president's budget will be. Uh, and so you typically, um, if there is a typical, uh, we're doing that in the, in the December, January timeframe sure. so that the president's budget can get to delivered in February. And then we engage with the next set of uh, uh, people that are part, an equally important part of this process, and that's Congress, right. uh, to explain the force design and the analysis and to answer questions and then move forward. And, and ultimately, a National Defense Authorization Act will get signed and then an appropriations. Uh, and that's when we'll actually uh, have money to be able to move forward. But the intent here uh, is to try to make sure that we don't have a gap uh, and we've got uh, a, a capability that we believe, as I mentioned earlier, makes sense to go to space right. for the reasons I mentioned earlier, and we believe that the technology uh, readiness levels are to the point now where we absolutely can do that. No, that's good to hear. So, I mean, I pushing for that joint solution versus having a bunch of, of stovepipe, you know, stop gaps in the various right. services and all. It, it's just so much more optimal to, to go to that joint solution. So, in terms of how we handle classification when it comes to our offensive and defensive capabilities, it's obviously a big issue. Uh, it's obviously going to be incredibly important when it comes to addressing China and Russia. We can't deter our adversaries if they don't know the extent of our capabilities. You know, we 
informally talking around here, we joke, but it's true. The key takeaway from Dr. Strange Club is if, if you don't tell your adversary what you have, it does, deterrence doesn't quite work. So how do you see that in, in the whole deterrence conversation? Sure. So a uh, great question and, and yet another piece of the um, uh, key areas that we're engaging uh, throughout uh, the Department of Defense uh, with the intelligence community, with the, uh, some of the White House staffs, um, and, and ultimately with Congress as well, uh, regular top area, because everybody sees the growing threat. Right. Um, and we recognize that, uh, the need for not only resilient architectures, but, you know, the unified command plan um, tasks U.S. Base Command, uh, you know, with um, offensive and defensive operations uh, and and our own capstone doctrine document highlights that um, but we've got to, we've got to work that through the process and so we'll work force designs right. to talk about what mix of capabilities are needed um, we've and we've got to do that within uh, the bounds of policy and and those types of things haven't haven't worked on the national security right, council right. staff and, and being a part of it on that side to understand that piece and so in this particular area we're in the middle of a space strategic review that the uh, the National Security Council uh, staff or National Security Advisor tasked uh, the Department of Defense and the uh, intelligence community uh, to go forward and do. Uh, we're in the middle of that now. It's due to wrap up in the late June, July timeframe. Uh, I anticipate that that will set um, kind of our um, playing field, if right. you will, um, and define some of the policy aspects for this administration. Every administration gets to define uh, their policies uh, going forward. And so we'll have a, a, a little bit more clarity as that wraps up. Right. And then we bring that, the Department of Defense and the uh, intelligence community, bring that over to the to the White House and, and we engage in, and work through that. And then we'll feed into a budget process just like we do now. So a few steps left to go to, right. to really understand where we need to go, but there's no doubt those types of capabilities are needed. And and called for in some of our guidance documents. No, I understand. So recently, the vice president announced that the United States isn't going to engage in destructive ASAP testing, and that we're going to encourage other nations to do the same. Now, in a recent hearing, the director of defense intelligence agency stated that the ban would likely have little effect on, on Chinese or Russian tests. So the question we have is, you know, when we look at this ban, um, how does it feed our strategy and requirements and, and, and how we handle a threat environment? Sure. So uh, another very good question and, and very topical, obviously. Um, so um, it was a great trip that the vice president had out to Vandenberg. Was able, she was able to engage with a bunch of guardians while she was there. And, and there she highlighted our U.S. commitment uh, to not conduct destructive direct ascent ASAT mm -hmm. missile testing. Um, that commitment was put in place, um, as you as you highlighted. Now we also are, are looking for uh, our allies and partners to to follow suit, and ideally right. we'll have a large number of nations uh, that make that commitment. Really, it's about the impact of destructive testing on orbit. Uh, we've seen the recent uh, Russian and, and Chinese uh, ASAT tests. Um, those were fit into that category of irresponsible behavior and created thousands of pieces right. of debris that we're still dealing with uh, today. And at the end of the day, um, doing testing that creates debris uh, of that flavor just makes it harder for all of us that operate in this domain. It's irresponsible. And so it, it only made sense for the United States to uh, take a leadership position uh, and commit to not doing that type of testing going forward. We look forward to engaging with allies and partners uh, to get similar commitments from them. And then ultimately, uh, hopefully we can grow from there in some of the United Nations forums uh, and, and the more formal about, um, elements where the State Department would be our lead uh, U.S. government entity, but certainly the Department of right. Defense is a piece of that, and the Space Force is one of the entities that will support the Department uh, as we go forward in those areas as well. No, I understand. So building off of that, one of the reasons the administration mentioned its decision to unilaterally ban destructive ASAT testing, you know, as, as you're discussing, was to help develop a norm of behavior that could be accepted by all nations. You know, you and Working Group in Geneva recently discussed the topic. So what is the Space Force's view on norms of behavior? Does DOD have a role when it comes to enforcing norms when they're violated? Yeah, so a uh, great question. Again, this commitment to not conduct destructive direct descent ASAP testing is all about 
being responsible in the domain and making sure that it's a safe and stable mm -hmm. domain going forward. Because at the end of the day, you know, our American way of war, certainly, but our American way of life is enabled by uh, the capabilities that space provides on a daily basis, right. whether that's contributing to national security, economic prosperity, or scientific knowledge. And so it only made sense. So the Space Force certainly uh, is a fan of norms of behavior, right. uh, responsible behavior, because it only benefits all of us in the domain. We, uh, General Raymond is, is um, regularly talks about uh, the value of responsible behavior and right. the need for it. Uh, he engages in multiple forums uh, where we talk about that internationally. Um, we, uh, as a part of the Department of Defense, uh, absolutely contribute to that conversation. And then our counterparts in the Office of Secretary of Defense Policy Office then engage with the State Department and other members of the interagency to inform our U.S. positions going forward. So I'm um, absolutely a believer in and supporter of norms of responsible behavior um, are a key part of defining those, right. um, but not the lead entity when it comes to engaging on the international stage uh, in a formal U.N. setting. The, the right. working group that you highlighted, that would be a State Department lead sure. uh, with the Department of Defense supporting. Um, but we have other forums where we also engage in these areas. So the Combined Space Operations uh, Forum that General Raymond is one of the U.S. Uh, members of uh, is really five eyes, France and Germany. Uh, that's a key piece of discussions that we have with those allies sure. in a multilateral fashion um, to, to talk about the values of responsible behavior. And, and I think we've seen great benefit in tightening the relationship between those nations um, and to where it's a, I would call it a chorus uh, of comments when there's irresponsible behavior right. in the domain, not just uh, General Raymond or the United States Space Force talking about the importance of it, but of many other nations as well. No, no that makes sense. And just you know, one more question in this zone, because I think it's really important to understand adversary intent. And, and really, what are your thoughts on why Russia and China continue to pursue these ASAP tests? I mean, are they really tests? Or do you think they're more along the lines of demonstrations to deter the U.S. and, and our allies? Sure. Um, I, I think the first thing I'd say is after five assignments in Washington, D.C., um, and, and 30 years in the, in the uh, space business on the DOD and IC side, I won't try to um, capture what an adversary's yeah. intent is. Um, but I'll say this. Um, they certainly, um, both China and Russia, certainly recognize the benefits uh, that we get, uh, right. the U.S. and our allies get from um, the capability Abilities that we have on orbit uh, and what the benefits that we have as a joint force mm -hmm. get from that. <clears throat> so they are actively pursuing a range of capabilities to counter uh, our systems and the advantages that we get from that destructive uh, ASAT right. test being one of those. Um, the reality is those things then highlight the importance of these resilient space architectures right. that we talked about earlier, right? And so it's the um, the value of space to, or the vital national interest that space provides to the nation, and this growing threat that's out there. There's a whole reason that the space force and United that the space force was created and U.S. Space Command was reestablished, uh, and so moving forward that. Th those types of things will continue sure. to shape the activities that both the service and the combatant command do in the context of the larger Department of Defense and National Security Space community. No, I understand. Okay, one last one here, and then we'll, we'll cut to the audience. Sure. But when we look at Ukraine, what are the lessons learned that Space Force is, is taking from this conflict right now? I mean, it, a lot of space headlines have been in the media recently. Um, and so I think it's, it's a really fertile area to discuss. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so certainly uh, much of the recent reporting talks about um, you can clearly see the value of uh, commercial space yep. uh, capabilities, and you can clearly see the value of proliferated sure. uh, architectures, which we've kind of talked about earlier. Uh, and so, you know, those types of things are being showcased uh, on a regular basis uh, right. as a part of the current conflict. Um, I would say from a Guardian's perspective, we're continuing to uh, do the things that uh, that we do every day um, in providing space capabilities uh, around the world, not just in, right. in one individual region, but um, certainly providing those capabilities around the world. Uh, guardians around the world are 24 seven, are focused sure. on delivering those capabilities. We deliver those capabilities and present them to combatant commands uh, who then uh, use those and organize uh, amongst their, their plans and how um, they actually conduct operations in those mm -hmm. various um, areas uh, of responsibility. And so we'll continue to do that um, but, but to your point, there are certainly uh, some, some big takeaways there. Um, and, you know, our work that we've done on these force designs highlights some of the very same mix. And so we'll continue down that path uh, as we go forward. No, that's really interesting. 
So we're going to now move to the open session to questions from the audience who've been listening to our conversation. So as a reminder to our listeners, you can participate in the Q&A by using the raise hand function on your device. When I call on you, please unmute your mic and state your name and affiliation for our guests before asking a question. You can also submit a question in writing using the Q&A function. So we're going to kick to the first one here. And that is from Josh Holiday, who's a fellow with us, right. is actually talking about how do you meet the scaling requirements when the demands for ISR are going to be so huge? I mean, they're already massive, but I think it's just going to scale from there. How sure. do you look at your, your enterprise construction? Yeah, really good question, Josh. Um, you know, I think, uh, again, having... Uh, uh, been in the national security space business, both on the DOD and the IC side for, for 30 years. Um, when it comes to ISR, I don't think you will ever meet all of the demand. Right? It's just that we, we, as a Department of Defense, have an insatiable demand for um, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, and that will continue as it should. Right. Um, the trick for us to the intent of the question is how much can we scale to be able to do that? Um, you know, Again, the work that we're doing is not intended to replace the unbelievable capabilities that the national intelligence community has um, on orbit today and will continue to put on orbit. We want to add to that. So to the point of being able to meet more and more requirements sure. um, at the end of the day, um, ISR works on a prioritization scheme and, and that's uh, been well documented and coordinated. And, and so uh, requirements uh, have a certain prioritization and they, and they get made met based on availability of systems and, and those requirements. Um, but by having additional uh, players in the space, uh, to use a bad pun, I guess, um, you know, we'll increase our ability to meet that demand. I think the other thing, to the point of a question we were talking about earlier, commercial industry is, right. is, is rapidly expanding in this space. Um, uh, over 100 companies, uh, I believe, last I heard, uh, working in this space. And, and so that will be capability that's there great benefits to some of the commercial ISR capability is that it is unclassified. It's often easier to share with allies and partners in some cases. Uh, so there's some additional benefits there besides just capacity, um, but it's going to take a combination of all those things to get close, to move in the right direction, uh, right. to scale, to meet the need. But I don't believe we'll ever be at a, a day where we say we now have the ability to meet every single intelligence surveillance and requir reconnaissance requirement. No, I understand. Got a question here from Shelley Vulcan. We SSC hosted an ISR reverse industry day last month. How will those insights fit into the ISR needs memo and coordination? Yeah, sure. So um, SSC, as a part of as one of our field commands, has started these reverse industry days, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the intent was to be able to share and, some. And just sorry to interrupt, but sure. for our audience, you mind defining? What sure. So. Um, the, uh, the intent there is, is really to have a true dialogue and share what it is that we, the government, are looking to move forward on, um, as well as hear from industry, uh, if you will, on, on right. how they believe they could uh, contribute to that. Uh, and so ISR was one of the first ones that they mm -hmm. did. I anticipate that General Gutlein and team will do that for multiple mission areas. Um, that'll be one of the data points, uh, certainly that'll feed into this, but we will also, I would anticipate, just like we did a business fair for the Missile Warning Missile Tracking Force design, I anticipate that uh, Mr. Cox and team will do one tied to our GMTI, which again, the intent would be to share red and blue models right. in the digital space to be able to allow companies uh, to uh, play with that in their model-based system engineering environment and come up with other solutions. And, and certainly every time that uh, we engage with industry, we're looking for creative ideas for other ways to uh, solve it because we don't believe we have the, right. um, you know, the sole purview on the right answers, no, uh, if you will. So I would anticipate that will come up, uh, Shelly. So great question. Thank you. No. We've got a question from Teresa Hitchens here online. Hi there, thank you, sir, for doing this today. It was very interesting. I have a process question. Um, there are a lot of moving parts uh, as you work through the ISR questions, and I'm trying to get a handle on how what you're doing in the integrated process team connects to what Mr. Cox is doing with the SWAC, connects to SSC. So in other words, what's the, can you, can you kind of follow the chain of activity for us so that we know the start point and the end point when it finally gets to a budget decision or a program of record? Thank you. Sure. Uh, great, great question, Teresa. And thank, thank you for asking. Thank you for dialing in today and taking some time out of your day. Um, so uh, the, uh, the way I would describe this is um, like many things uh, within uh, 
the Department of Defense processes, within national security processes. Um, in some cases, some things will run in parallel. Um, and so the force design certainly had uh, started based on a previous tasking um, before uh, the JROC designated us as a, the joint requirements integrator, before we started this ISR uh, integrated process team. Uh, so there's been a little bit of work in parallel. Um, but I would say that the same inputs that we've received in the, uh, in the IPT uh, from the other services, Mr. Cox and team uh, regularly interface with the services as well. So they're getting some of that there. We'll need to do some uh, work for sure to, to keep these things integrated as they go forward. Um, but the way our capability development process would work is we start with uh, strategy and concepts which feed the force design work that Mr. Cox and team are working in the the Space Warfighting Analysis Center. They then feed um, both halves of my organization, the requirements team, uh, for if we have requirements changes that we need to make, and the budget team when it comes to providing the analysis to defend the budget going forward. Um, as Space Systems Command is one of our three field commands that contribute to our uh, Space Force budget process. Uh, so they will have a, a hand in that budget process, but also when it comes to capability development, once we finalize what are the set of requirements um, for space-based ISR, those would then get handed to not, not only Space Systems Command, but many of the acquisition uh, organizations. Space Systems Command from a process perspective, as I think you're aware, runs a, a, a forum called the Program Integration Council, where they bring all of the um, acquisition PEOs together to, to compare notes, to synchronize efforts. And so as those requirements are finalized, it would go to uh, a forum like that, um, where they would then talk about, okay, how do we divide up, uh, if you will, the requirements amongst various acquisitions acquisition organizations. At the same time, again, we're doing this in concert with the intelligence community. Uh, and so we've got to keep a, a close touch point there. Uh, we have several forums uh, where uh, the Space Force and the National Reconnaissance Office and the Director of uh, National Intelligence uh, work together in these areas. And so we'll have to keep doing that uh, in concert with them as well, because again, we're not trying to replace the wonderful capabilities that they have right now and that they're pursuing, but to look at what complementary capabilities we can bring forward. So there, I mean, the short answer is there's not a, a black and white start and stop. Um, and as a matter of fact, even after we get to a, a validated requirement and we've got uh, acquisition organizations producing systems to meet those requirements, it's never really done because then you feed back. Um, ideally in this digital space that we're working right now, uh, some of those, acquis well, those acquisitions will result not only in on-orbit uh, hardware, but also will result in digital twins. And the intent would be as SSC or other acquisition organizations get a digital twin, uh, they would then feed that back to Mr. Cox and team so that instead of a blue model, we're now using the actual digital twin mm -hmm. of the on-orbit system and our process starts over again. So it's really a cyclic process, yeah. um, but that's how those pieces parts connect. I hope that answered your question, Teresa. Yeah, that, that actually helped. Will it, but, but will it be, I mean, I guess my key question in all this is, is where do things get deconflicted between NRO's processes? Because they have their own budget process and cycle that they go through very similar. I mean, I think it's less complicated because they're smaller, um, uh, but they have a similar budget process that they have to go through every year. Where do, does this issue of, of ISR get deconflicted? Is this something that's gonna happen in the strategic review or is it something that happens every time in the pick or, or how does that, in other words, I'm, again, I'm trying to connect, kind of connect the wires, you know? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, let's expand on that. So I, yes, I think the pick will be a piece of this. However, as I mentioned, there are uh, some other forums where we interface with uh, the intelligence community. Uh, for one, they're uh, participating in the IPT itself. Uh, and so we've got that. Next, as we take that requirements needs memo that I mentioned and get that validated, the next step will be a gaps analysis. That gaps analysis will be DOD and the IC working together uh, to say what is it that the IC is currently planning to budget for and how much of those requirements can they cover so that we understand the piece that would be complementary from a Department of Defense perspective. Um, the 
the Program Integration Council then feeds to the Space Acquisition Council, which is uh, called for by law. It's run by our uh, Space Acquisition Executive, uh, Mr. Frank Calvelli, who's just uh, joined. Uh, the Director of the National Reconnaissance Office is a part of that uh, forum. Uh, so there's another touch point where we compare notes. Um, what we did with missile warning, missile tracking was uh, we took a look at all of the requirements and the different pieces of the force design. And we use that Space Acquisition Council as a way to say, we're going to take the low Earth orbit aspects of missile warning, missile tracking, and assign that to the Space Development Agency. And we're going to take the medium Earth orbit aspects of that force design and assign that to Space Systems Command. I would envision doing something very similar for each successive force design, uh, ISR being one of those. Thank you. That was really helpful. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Sure, we've got a question here from Betsy Pimento. How do you bring international capabilities into force design activities and how will you evaluate in which mission areas and to what extent the international players can engage? Yeah, so another great question, Betsy. Thanks for asking. Um, so we've, we've uh, done a couple things um, uh, for starters, um, and, and we'll look to continue those. Uh, first, um, specific to force design and our allies, uh, one of the things that uh, General Raymond does as our, as our chief of space operations uh, every year is he hosts a space chiefs forum. Uh, he's done that uh, um, at the same time as the National Space Symposium every year. Um, and so each time he's hosted an International Space Chiefs Forum. Uh, the first year he did that in concert with General Goldfein, it was an Air and Space Chiefs Forum. As we became a separate service now, he's run uh, two of those uh, two years ago, so two symposiums ago. Um, one of the things that he did uh, was he had Mr. Cox provide uh, a presentation on some of the lessons that they learned right. from their early force design work. Um, and so uh, that was a starting point. Yep. Um, then from there, uh, we participate, we the Space Force participate in, in several different forums. Number one, we do space engagement talks bilaterally with individual allies and partners, but we also participate in uh, uh, security cooperation forums that the Office of Secretary of Defense Policy Office, uh, so uh, Assistant Secretary Plum's team will run, and those are bilateral as well. And so in several of those recent bilateral space cooperation forums, the SWAC has provided briefings on their force designs, sure. uh, lessons that they've learned from those and then asked allies and partners, so specifically uh, the UK, France, and Australia mm -hmm. thus far. Um, and I think we've actually had one engagement with Japan as yep. well, where they talked a little bit about their force design work to highlight what lessons they've learned so far and what force designs they're doing uh, coming up okay. so that if those individual countries are um, planning uh, procurements, if you right. will, that dovetail with that, that ideally uh, we can work together. They can be aware of the force design work that's going on. Um, we may, you know, at some point in the future, maybe we get to a point where some of our allies have a similar organization right. and we can connect. Right now, I think it, well, it's, it's early for that, but we wanna share those lessons because um, at the same time, as I mentioned, we wanna use government capability. Right. We wanna use DOD and intelligence community capabilities in some cases, commercial. Um, if there's an ally or a partner that have capability that's complementary, uh, it only makes sense to leverage that and, and do cooperative capability development. It's no easy task. Yep. Um, the, the US process for capability development and budgeting is hard enough. Every other country has their own process, but it just takes continuing to engage, uh, keep each other informed, and ideally find those areas where we can come up with a cooperative capability mission area. No, good deal. We've got Frank Wolf online. Frank? Okay, great. Um, yeah, um, General, I just wanted to uh, <clears throat> go back to uh, the SWAC's um, force design for uh, space-based GMTI. Um, and I just wanted, uh, you obviously, uh, monitoring traffic patterns uh, is obviously valuable, borders, uh, high priority targets, but I wanted to check with you on your thoughts on why is GMTI needed for targeting? Basically, maybe I missed it, but again, I didn't hear much about Joint Star's uh, contributions in, in Afghanistan and Iraq toward, toward that targeting. And it seemed to me at least, and maybe I'm just missing it, but it seemed to me as if the airstrikes on moving targets from a variety of bombers, uh, fighters, uh, predator, et cetera, et cetera um, reapers happened without Joint Star's contribution. But again, maybe I'm missing it. So I just wanted to see what your thoughts are on why is GMTI needed and what's the justification for spending possibly billions of dollars on space GMTI, which as you know, has been tried before in efforts like Discover 2, Future Imagery Architecture. Um, so 
can can significantly less costly UAVs operate in those highly contested environments to track high priority targets and save us a lot of money, obviously. Yeah, so a uh, gr great question, Frank. So let me try to tackle this uh, from a couple, couple different angles. Uh, um, as the Department of Defense moves forward with the joint warfighting concept uh, and the supporting concepts that are there, uh, there is no doubt that uh, from our uh, information advantage supporting concept and feeding the joint warfighting concept that adversary uh, moving and relocatable targets are a key challenge that's facing the joint force. And for us to succeed uh, in the joint warfighting concept, if you will, we've got to have the ability to detect moving targets. There's no doubt about that. Um, Secretary Kendall's operational imperatives highlight very much the same thing. One of his imperatives is specifically focused on moving target indication and being able to feed the other systems that certainly that the Air Force has from, uh, you know, B-21 um, family of systems to um, uh, other strike capabilities to things that the rest of the joint force uh, might need to be able to track moving targets and engage those because our adversaries certainly uh, have those types of capabilities. Um, what neither one of those do is dictate specifically um, you know, how we do this. Uh, and so that's what this force design is designed to look at. Um, certainly the Air Force uh, has uh, provided JSTARS to the Joint Force for, for a long time. Uh, and the users of the data that come from JSTARS are, are very much appreciative of it and, and do not want it to go away uh, because of the value they get from it. And so, um, Again, recognizing the anti-access area denial uh, threats that are out there and the difficulties of getting an, an air platform in far enough uh, into the conflict space, if you will, it seemed to only make sense to uh, do some of that from space. Uh, and do I think space will be the only game in town? No, I think it will be a combination uh, of, of assets to be able to do that potentially some of the ones that, that you highlighted as well, but there's uh, absolutely a role for space and the, and the trick for us in this force design, like with all of them, is we've got to be able to find uh, a way to do this that uh, um, uh, meets the laws of physics, if you will, in the domain, uh, that does it in a resilient fashion, and we've got to be able to do it in a fashion that's affordable to be able to do within our uh, budget space that we have. That's no easy task. I, I don't mean to, to make it sound that way, uh, and there's still several steps to go before we get there, but uh, we're committed to doing it because we know the importance of it. Right. Well, just in the terms of the big, biggest challenges you see in, in getting to a more costly, I mean, a more uh, affordable um, space-based GMTI, what would you say in that in that regard? What do, what do you see as the big, because obviously we've had these efforts in the past. I mean, how do you, how do, you do that? How do you get to, to space-based GMTI, which is a, a formidable technical challenge um, that it seems as if commercial industry, there are some, there's some capability, but there's no real industry demand for it. So how do you get to even using commercial capabilities for it? But, but basically, what do you see as the biggest technical challenge for you all to, to get it to be more affordable if you were to go down that road. Yeah, sure. So the first thing I want to say is I, I don't want to presuppose the the answers that will come out of the force design because Mr. Cox and team are still working and and uh, I owe that to them as a, as a good partner to, to give them the time to, to do that analysis and then we will uh, happily take it. But I would say what we learned from the missile warning missile tracking force design um, is uh, a, a hybrid approach uh, was important uh, there to ensure that we were resilient, but could also do the mission of missile warning missile tracking, uh, if you will. Um, and uh, we kind of reiterate the value of, of commercial industry. And um, from my experience in, in work in the national security space arena, um, if and when there's a, a challenge put forward, nobody better than U.S. industry to come forward with uh, creative ideas uh, on how to meet some of that. Uh, I, I think I would imagine there'll be a combination again. Uh, most of the designs I think going forward will be a combination of government and commercial type systems. Um, and you know, we have a benefit in, in the, uh, the exponential growth of our uh, commercial space industry has, has done a lot of things. It's brought down the cost of space launch. Um, which allows us to think about uh, satellites differently and procuring satellites differently. It's led to the ability to do proliferated architectures. I certainly think that will be um, a piece of what goes forward. And so the, that, uh, the benefit that we have from our U.S. industry uh, will be a contributing factor to us uh, being able to do this in an affordable fashion, as well as 
kind of doing that force design analysis, which one of the levers or one of the lenses that they do all of the force designs and look through them is cost. And the value of that analysis is that we take that into the Department of Defense processes uh, and articulate why it is we believe we need the force design that we've got. We show the analysis, we talk about the performance, we talk about the resilience, and we talk about the cost, um, but still a few steps to go. I, again, I, I don't mean to understate how difficult this will be, um, but I, I think we're moving in the right direction. Thanks. No, and the Mitchell Institute perspective, I'd be remiss if I didn't say it here. If you look at the demand signal that the J-STARS crews have met over the last 20 years, I mean, we have flown those things into the ground. And so I think the, the demand is overwhelming. And if you look at groups like the Army and all that rushing to get get post solutions and all that, our perspective is it's, it's hugely important. Plus, we're really worried about the battle management community. I mean, they have been run hard, and, and it's just important that we steward that very carefully. So we've got time for one more. It's from okay. Caitlin Lee of our team. And she wants to ask about integrated deterrence and okay. how the Space Force sees itself in that world. Is that something where it's a force provider more or we provide own, our own a set of warfighting capabilities as we look to the future? Sure. How do you see it? Yeah, so a great question, uh, Caitlin. Um, the way I would describe this is uh, absolutely the Space Force, as with the other services, are a key piece of integrated deterrence, right? The National Defense Strategy came out and we, uh, and we talk about um, the three ways that the Department of Defense is uh, planning to implement that strategy. One of those is integrated deterrence. Then you've got campaigning and building enduring advantage. Our budget was built last year with that in mind. Um, again, you know, to the point we were talking about earlier about a process and where's the start and where's the end. The, the, the budgeting and strategy development processes don't run that way either. They run in, in parallel. And so as the national defense strategy was being drafted, we had a guardian detailed to the core team working on that. Uh, she worked uh, for me on the five side of the house, but she worked closely then with our eight side of the house as we go to build the budget. So our budget, as well as the U.S. Air Force budget, uh, was built with the intent to support integrated deterrence our resilient architectures is the best example of one of the primary contributions that we will have to integrated deterrence. Um, no doubt about the fact that um, that type of an architecture certainly helps deny the benefits uh, that an adversary might seek by trying to counter our architectures um, to move forward. Um, in the budget, we also had work on protected satellite communications. Again, kind of increasing resilience, right. if you will, um, work towards, uh, you know, GPS, a little bit of contributing to integrated deterrence, but certainly a big piece of campaigning in the right. constant uh, work that we do with Space Systems Command to, to upgrade that system on a regular basis and stay uh, ahead of uh, threats and things. So as we bring on the next generation of GPS satellites and they become um, higher power, more anti-jam resistant, all of those things will contribute to integrated deterrence. And then the work that we're doing right now in that strategic strategic review, um, which as we uh, take that through the Department of Defense um, up to the Secretary of Defense and the DNI, who were both tasked as the leads, and then over to the White House, that will also shape the way going forward in the 24 budget and beyond uh, for other things that we would do to contribute to integrated deterrence. But absolutely, Space Force, one of all the services uh, contributing to and, and executing things that are part and parcel of integrated deterrence. So a really good question. Uh, I really appreciate that. So, sir, with that, we've come to the end of the Space Power Forum. I'd like to offer a big thanks to you. And I'd also like to thank our audience. And from all of us here at the Mitchell Institute Space Power Advantage Center of Excellence, have a great day.